so I, I presume that the virtual clapping is now dying down. And thank you. Um, thanks for that uh, introduction. I'm glad you mentioned the creature trip because that's something I'm most proud of. Um, just a, 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 um, a correction. Uh, you correctly said that my book on colonialism was due out in July of this year. It's been postponed until February of next year, um, but it will come out. Um, uh, we're just about at the process of producing the, the galley proofs. Fine, so um, I'm going to talk to a paper that has the title, uh, A Theological Ethic of Military Uses of Artificial Intelligence, Sustaining Virtue, Granting Autonomy and Calibrating Risk. And I, I understood my particular brief to be, uh, to draw out some of the, or at least to, to state some of the theological um, elements of an approach to the ethics of um, military uses of AI. So, um, first of all, as I understand it, and I should say, um, I'm not an expert. I haven't dwelt, dwelt very long um, in the world of artificial intelligence. So I, I'm quite aware that there are people attending this virtual conference who are more familiar with the phenomena uh, than I am, and I am absolutely open to being educated. So don't uh, hold back. Um, as I understand it, art artificial intelligence in military operations comes in two kinds. First, there is narrow or specific intelligence. That's to say the autonomous ability to identify an instance of a species of target and to track its changes of position, for example. And second, there is broad or general intelligence. That's to say the autonomous ability to choose a species of target identify instances, track their movements, decide when to, track to, when to strike them, learn from errors, and improve upon initial choices. Now, um, from my reading, I've gathered there is um, something of a debate about quite how to define what autonomous means and how it relates to semi-autonomous and automatic. Um, 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 but I'm giving you my, my best understanding of the clearest uh, um, um, set of concepts here. Um, these two kinds of artificial intelligence raise ethical questions, mainly I see, as I see it because of two features. First of all, the physical distance they put between the human agents deploying them and their targets and their ability to act independently of those agents. Those are the two, two features, the physical distance and the ability to act independently of those agents. And then uh, the main ethical questions these features raise are three. First, how to maintain the traditional martial, martial virtues of fortitude and chivalry, among other things, whilst operating uh, lethal weapons at a safe distance. Second, how much autonomy to grant a machine. And third, what risks to take with the possibility of technical error. Now, in fact, there's a fourth issue that, that has emerged in my reading on the plane over to San Francisco yesterday. Um, I was reading the uh, 2016 report by Human Rights Watch, um, making the case it's called, and that raised for me a, another issue, which is, is the allocation of responsibility, and I'll make brief comment on that uh, um, uh, toward the end of the paper. But first of all, um, the issue of virtue. Um, the feature of physical distance between, between military agent and military effect has given rise to worries about the future of traditional military virtues. Uh, different cultures engender different kinds of military ethos, of course, and different ethe or ethoses promote different sets of virtues. Uh, the military cultures of Yingus Khan's Mongols, or the SS, were not exactly the same as those of medieval Christendom or the British Army in the Second World War. Some virtues are bound by the nature of warfare to feature in all military cultures, most notably physical courage, honor, and loyalty. And I myself would add a certain kind of callousness, which I have provocatively uh, um, suggested might be considered to be a military virtue. To these generic military virtues, the specific, specific military ethos of a Christianized culture 
will add charitable self-restraint and mercy. These Christian virtues are generated partly by a theological anthropology, according to which all humans share the status of sinners in need of divine forgiveness, and partly by a theological soteriology, according to which the punishment of wrongdoing should always be in the service never of the lust of vengeance, but only ever of a desire for reconciliation in the form of a just peace. These two theological doctrines issue in the following moral implications. That those who are morally justified in fighting should allow the ultimate end of a just peace to temper their military means. That those who wage unjustified war may not be regarded as simply morally alien. That the intention of just belligerency should not be to rid the world of evil by annihilating the unjust enemy but rather to stop a particular outbreak of grave wrongdoing by rendering unjust warriors incapable of further fighting. And that there is no good reason to seek to harm non-combatants. These theologically generated moral implications entail that just warriors should cultivate the virtues of self-restraint and mercy in the manner of their use of lethal force. Some ethicists believe that by putting a military, a human military operator of, say, a semi-autonomous armed unmanned aerial vehicle, UAV or drone, at a safe arm's length from the battlefield, by doing that, artificial intelligence tends to corrode military virtues. I have to say I'm not persuaded. It is true that a uniformed agent in Arizona or East Anglia who is operating a drone in Afghanistan is completely safe from physical harm and therefore doesn't have to exercise the courage necessary to overcome the natural fear of such harm. However, that is only because of the happenstance that the enemy in Afghanistan lacks the ability to strike back with long range missiles. Operating a military drone over Russia, for example, would not be quite so safe. Besides, the virtue of physical courage is a typical requisite of frontline combat troops and of support troops who might find themselves pushed into the front line. It's not typically requisite of those who, though civilian, are nevertheless contributing to the waging of war safely remote from the front line. That's to say, it seems to me, the waging of war involves a spectrum of exposure to physical harm, as it probably always has done, whereby some war wages are safer than others. That's to say, the virtue of physical courage has not been expected of all war wages. Wages, let's call them warriors, for a long time, perhaps ever. Robert Sparrow observes that while the pilots of, of UAVs lack the opportunity to exercise and cultivate physical courage, they can still exercise and develop moral courage, whether in deciding to take human life or refusing to obey what appears to be an illegal or immoral order. And the serious cost of bearing the responsibility for exercising such courage is evident in reports among predator and reaper pilots of PTSD. But he worries that this does not distinguish them from ambulance drivers, surgeons, and rescue work workers, except insofar as their role involves a deliberate decision to kill. And in that respect, it does not distinguish them at all from armed policemen. To which my response is, but why should it? As for the virtue of honor, in the general sense of upholding the standards of conduct expected of members of the military profession or unit, Sparrow rightly observes that UAV operators are less likely to be thrown off the moral course by fear of death or injury than combatants. Sometimes, however, military honor is perceived specifically in terms of chivalry and chivalry in terms of fairness. Accordingly, it seems dishonorable that a UAV operator should be able to strike the enemy with devastating force while remaining absolutely immune from retaliation. The gross asymmetry of power seems grotesquely unfair. And this is a common perception. I say that uh, because uh, of my recent work on um, colonialism, um, several historians um, became 
have become quite indignant about the British use of, uh, for example, artillery or uh, Maxim guns in Africa. Um, and because it seemed so unfair that the Brits should be uh, using modern weaponry on um, um, African natives, although African natives were in fact well supplied with rifles, but there we are. Um, my own view is that this is, a, this, this is to misunderstand what war is about. So it's a common perception that this is unfair, but I think it's a mistaken one. Uh, the aim of any belligerency is so to overwhelm the enemy as to disable him from continuing to fight. And this is done by applying the greatest possible force against him at his weakest point. Whatever the place of fairness in war, it does not consist in making sure that the enemy is equally well resourced before you engage him. Sparrow is largely correct, therefore, when he writes, quote, we need to be careful to avoid relying on an argument about chivalry here. War isn't a game, and there is no reason that it should be fair. Now, uh, there, there may be a place for fairness in, in warfare, but not, not here. Regarding loyalty, there are different kinds, and not all kinds should be expected of all warriors. For a Christian, of course, there can be no such thing as absolute loyalty to, to any human institution, including the nation, since the Christian's primary loyalty must be to God and his moral law, and since human institutions sometimes transgress that law. As Sir Thomas More said on the scaffold moments before he was beheaded, and I quote, I die the, good, the king's good servant, but God's first. Members of a combat unit need to be able to depend on their comrades to protect them and aid them in the most threatening and terrifying of circumstances if they are to be militarily effective. That will require group loyalty of a peculiar intensity. Other warriors will need to show themselves loyal under God to a just cause, loyal to the state that fights in a just cause and loyal to the state institutions and military units that serve that just cause. But they, need, but they need not cultivate the same kind of loyalty as a combat unit. Again, Spiro worries that this blurs the line between civilian and military. But again, I fail to see why that's a problem. Concerning the virtue of charitable self-restraint, it seems obvious that military agents who are distanced from the confusing, threatening maelstrom of the battlefield and whose security against risk permits maximal caution are more likely to be capable of exercising restraint than combat troops. What's more, according to Dave Grossman's classic 1995 book on killing, the psychological cost of learning to kill in war and society, the closer troops are to the enemy, the greater their reluctance to kill. To this, Paul Shah adds the observation that the cameras of a UAV can bring its pilot face to face with the target. Therefore, while, it, while, it, while that may be responsible for causing the unhappy effect of PTSD when he decides to kill, it is also likely to cause the happy effect of increasing his reluctance to make such a decision. For this reason, I doubt Sparrow's argument that because UAV pilots never meet their enemies, never meet their enemies, such compassion as they have, quote, must necessarily be abstract, which will also rule out genuine acts of mercy. Meeting the enemy may not be necessary to induce merciful restraint and killing. Seeing them may suffice. Now, having read that, I, I, um, I had a, a student at Oxford who um, is in the USAF and is a fighter pilot read a draft of this paper. And he reported that in his experience, uh, too many UAV operators uh, do um, do, do uh, react to what they're doing as if they were playing a video game. So um, there may be more of a problem there than I have um, admitted in the text of the paper. In general, I'm skeptical that the military uses of artificial intelligence will lead to a decline in military, military virtues. As the means of war evolve, so do the relevant virtues and their distribution. While the traditional virtues will still be required of military personnel performing traditional roles, there may be novel roles that require a different set of virtues. What will be important, however, is not to require a person who has been made to cultivate one set of virtues to perform a role that requires a different set. 
I don't agree, therefore, with Shannon Vella when she argues that the military use of AI will generally de-skill military personnel, depriving them of the opportunity to cultivate through experience the virtue of practical wisdom, that is prudence, which is needed for making the right choices in rapidly changing circumstances about, quote, who or what get ta gets target, targeted, or when, in which circumstances, or with what degree of force. For sure, the pilots of UAVs will not develop the virtue of physical courage, as must those of manned aircraft, together with combat soldiers and sailors. However, being safely removed from the theater of operations, UAV pilots are less likely to have their practical judgment thrown off course by pain or fear or anger, and over time they will accumulate experience in decision-making and thereby cultivate prudence. In other words, they will be stronger in one military virtue while being weaker in another, differently skilled, not de-skilled. The second ethical question raised by the military uses of artificial intelligence is how much autonomy to grant, grant, to grant weapons. And this in turn raises a further issue about virtue. The pressure to increase autonomy arises partly because of the danger that the communication link with the weapon might be broken and partly because of the need for speed in responding to enemy action. Speed and therefore autonomy is especially important for effective cyber defense. Autonomy comes in degrees and is never absolute. According to Sparrow, almost all of the, rob almost all of the robotic weapon systems currently being developed are either remotely operated or, or unmanned rather than fully autonomous. Their autonomy consists of using sensors to read the environment and identify a target, and then processors to decide how to respond, say by adapting to the target's movements. Beyond that, however, a human operator is usually required to make key decisions, or at least has the power to intervene in the machine's decision-making process. That's to say, humans remain either in the loop or on the loop. The key decision that carries the greatest moral weight is, of course, the decision to strike. And according to Paul Shah, quote, for most weapon systems in use today, a human makes the decision whether or not to engage the target. But not all systems. Israel's Harpy drone, for example, is largely autonomous. It not only loiters overhead and searches, searches for potential targets, but can decide to strike without asking for human permission. That said, the drone's autonomy isn't absolute. The human operator still determines which species of target the drone should home in on, say enemy radars, while the drone itself decides only which specimens to attack. It is autonomy over the decision to strike a target that raises moral issues. For that decision, which may cause the grave non-moral evil of the destruction of human life, ought to issue from deliberation about the just war principles of discrimination and proportionality. Applying these principles on the battlefield is not straightforward logic, is not a straightforward logical mechanical operation. It requires the interpretation of circumstances, the estimation of military necessity and the urgency of action, and perhaps the discrimination of combatants and civilian clothes from non-combatants. However, Whereas computers are often more, more intelligent, intelligent and faster in performing narrowly specified tasks, according to Shah, they, quote, still fall far short of humans in understanding context and interpreting meaning, that is, in general intelligence. And artificial intelligence is, according to Shah, um, only a hypothetical future. Unlike humans, he says, autonomous weapons systems lack the ability to step outside their instructions and employ common sense to adapt to the situation at hand. Whereas human agents are capable of using their common sense and better judgment to comply with the intent behind a rule rather than the rule itself, autonomous systems are not. And if I can bring some um, um, interesting historical material from the footnote into the text, I'll mention that uh, uh, one example of how um, actual human military intelligence requires distinguishing intent from rule it was to be found um, in 1797 when the then Commodore Horatio Nelson 
disobeyed the orders of Admiral John Sir, Sir John Jarvis at the Battle of Cape St. Vincent. Um, Nelson's biographer John Sugden comments that Nelson, quote, prided himself on what he called political courage and repeatedly acted on it, even in contravention of the orders of, of superiors. Yet if Nelson acted against the strict letter of Jarvis's orders, he must assuredly remain within their spirit. It seems the Admiral agreed, because when his flag captain complained to him about Nelson's disobedience, Jarvis is said to have responded, quote, it was certainly so, and if you ever commit such a breach of orders, I will forgive you also. So whereas human agents are capable of using their common sense and better judgment to distinguish the intent from a rule, and sometimes to follow the intent rather than the rule, autonomous systems are not so capable. What this implies is that we can't expect a weapon system to exercise the virtue of prudence, and that we should expect a fully autonomous system which cannot be recalled or supervised, and which can make a decision to strike on its own. We can expect it to act imprudently, not always, but sometimes. Now, Shah goes on to suggest that an autonomous weapon could observe the principle of proportionality if humans programmed it to avoid risking the lives of a certain number of non-combatants. But, but that would be to imply a very crude utilitarian understanding of the principle. According to classic just war thinking, provided that one does not intend to harm non-combatants, and provided that one actualizes that intention by earnestly seeking to avoid causing such harm, how much risk one may take with non-combatant lives will depend on a range of circumstances. These will include the importance of the military objective, the military possibility and affordability of adopting less risky ways of achieving it, and the political consequences of non-combatant deaths. The principle of proportionality requires that risks to life be calibrated to a set of circumstances. And since circumstances are constantly changing and not all sets of them can be predicted, there does not exist an absolute number that can be programmed into a weapon system that would make its action proportionate. Shah also suggests that it would be morally safe to use autonomous weapon systems in an environment devoid of civilians. That would certainly avoid imprudence causing a disproportionate number of non-combatant deaths. But the principle of proportionality also applies to the killing of enemy combatants. One shouldn't kill more of them than military necessity requires. And Shah himself makes the point that autonomous weapons would find it difficult to recognize genuine attempts at surrender, since that requires discerning intent amid circumstances that might be highly ambiguous. At this point, uh, forgive me, Anton, I'm going to depart from my text and just um, add uh, some remarks on the Human Rights Watch um, report, making the case the dangers of killer robots and the need for a preemptive ban published in 2016, um, which argues that fully autonomous weapons are not likely to be able to comply with international humanitarian law uh, on the principles of um, distinction or discrimination and proportionality. Now that's how the report puts it. I, I'm inclined to say, I prefer to say that, um, no, it's not like, it, it is likely that weapons will, will make errors um, in uh, decisions and, and those errors are likely to um, produce uh, indiscriminate and disproportionate results. Um, um, but I find the way in which the, the report puts the point um, a bit confusing because, um, I mean, international humanitarian law, like Christian just war thinking, says that um, it is wrong to intend to kill civilians. Um, but of course, a weapon system can't intend anything. <laughs> uh, it may well make an error um, uh, and, and kill um, civilians when, when um, it might not have done, um, but that, that can't be, it can't be a criminal act or, or even a, an immoral act. 
um, whereas the Human Rights Watch report seems to think it, it can be a criminal act. Um, but even the law says that, 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 that um, the principle of discrimination requires an intention uh, to, to um, strike civilians, or at least culpable negligence in striking them. Um, and it seems to me that a weapon simply can't be capable either of an immoral action or a criminal act. Um, um, and that raises, this is, this is where the issue of, of the allocation of responsibility arises. Um, uh, because the, the uh, Human Rights Watch report uh, um, complains that um, the operation of, of fully autonomous weapons um, would not um, permit the assignation of direct responsibility because the weapon is not responsible. Uh, and therefore, um, if, a, if human, human beings are responsible, it's not directly, which is true. Um, to which my response is fine. <laughs> then then um, um, those who decided to take the risks of deploying such weapons, knowing that there were um, uh, risks of these kinds, are responsible. Now, as I'll go on to, to, to discuss, um, sometimes the taking of high risks is morally permissible. And so even though they're responsible for this weapon that then made, made a catastrophic mistake, it could be that though they're responsible, they're not culpable because the risk they took was, was all things considered a reasonable one, but we can come on to that in a moment. Um, but the, 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 the Human Rights Watch report um, um, uh, thinks that, that, that even in, in in assigning indirect responsibility, there are problems, but I, I'm not persuaded about that. Anyway, back on track, I'm on. So um, um, we're coming on to toward the final point. So I might conclude that morally speaking, one should never permit a weapon system to be fully autonomous in the sense that it can make the decision to strike on its own and without suffering interference from a human supervisor. The risk of disproportionate deaths, both combatant and non-combatant, would, combatant would be too high. So here's, here's the, the, the final um, moral issue, the question of risk and uh, the taking of risks. Uh, so it might be said the risk is too high, but in my view, uh, risks of some kind or another are, are often unavoidable and their proportionality varies according to circumstances. I think it's true that the graver the threat, the higher the risks worth taking. So there may be grave circumstances where launching fully autonomous weapons is proportionate. However, for such risky action to be prudent, those deciding upon it would have to have their eyes fully open. The temptation, especially with novel, sophisticated technology, is to indulge in wishful thinking and to downplay the risks. And in all my reading, I mean, I've read several articles and I've read Paul Charles, Charles book. Um, the the um, spokesperson for <laughs> highly optimistic thinking about uh, artificial intelligence and weapons is Ron Arkin. Arkin. I've never read him, read him myself, but uh, he clearly is, is um, he, he's a roboticist and is, is clearly very confident that uh, technology will deal with all these problems. Uh, most people, including myself, are rather doubtful about that. Um, in addition, uh, uh, there is the phenom phenomenon of automation bias, that is, um, the tendency of humans to defer to machines, which has been observed. Yet, as uh, Paul Shah rightly says, 100% error-free operation is impossible, and failures are inevitable in complex, tightly coupled systems, and the sheer complexity of the system inhibits predicting when and how failures are likely to recur to occur. Therefore, before launching fully autonomous weapons, the morally responsible human agents need to stare the worst case scenarios squarely in the face and satisfy themselves that they're worth, worth risking and that should they come about, they could be afforded. Now, my perception is that kind of um, eschewing wishful thinking and uh, looking the worst case scenarios fully in the face is um, not as common as it should be. 
In some cases, the cost will not be affordable, and so the risk not worth taking. And, and if the price of this is military defeat, then that has to be borne according to Christian just war thinking. The tradition of just war thinking sanctions belligerency only under certain conditions. Absent those conditions, war isn't just, fighting it isn't just. And at that point, the just warrior clambers off his war horse and joins the pacifist on his knees, praying God to secure the justice that he himself cannot. Then together, they both rise and look around for non-military means of resistance. Thanks very much. Um, yeah, please join me in another virtual round of applause. Um, I, um, so as I said, I, I will respond for 10-ish minutes now. Um, and obviously I want to begin by thanking Professor Bigger for a terrific paper. Um, I think, you know, in thinking and reading about the military uses of, um, yeah, of AI, there's a striking lack of attention to all of these questions. And sometimes I think that the greatest threat of the digital age is not exactly that our virtues will deteriorate, but that we will somehow ignore the fact that we were supposed to be exercising the virtues all along and that um, we are in an unconditional or even eternal sense answerable for what we're doing. Um, so I think the insistence on the abiding and permanent ethical weight of decisions about what are always matters of life and death, you know, I think it's uh, laudable and crucial, in fact. Um, so yeah, I've, I've come up with three constellations of kinds of questions that I'd like to raise, and I'm, uh, I'm going to voice them in the most skeptical and aggressive manner possible, but I hope it's clear that they come from a friendly place and that I'm mostly asking because sometimes, you know, I'm uh, embarrassed to like raise them at all, but I think it could be helpful uh, for the purposes of clarification to try to drive the sharpest wedge. Um, uh, and then you can, yeah, please feel free to answer whichever in whatever order. Um, I, I know that we can't do justice to everything that you've said. Um, so the first kind of cluster of questions that I'm interested in is about the description of various acts of mechanized or automated war in terms of traditional military virtues. Um, now I see that the shape of the worry that recurs in the paper is that traditional virtue, traditional military virtues might be eroded. But I think something to ask is why we should think that the traditional virtues are relevant at all to various kinds of um, practices in automated war. And, and furthermore, what would be at stake in, in um, in that description. So, I mean, as you noted, uh, the, the virtues are variable by culture and ethe, and more than variable, they arguably, uh, some of them emerge from and die with particular ways of life. So chivalry and fortitude are neither the Virtus nor Andrea of the ancient world. They have a completely different register and lexicon of practical applications. So yeah, one kind of sub-question is why we would continue to use these medieval or Victorian terms that are no longer intrinsic to the way in which we think or act as a matter of fact. I mean, in fact, I don't hear people talking in these terms outside of the philosophy seminar or the you know, conferences on virtue ethics very much. So maybe another way to put this is um, what we take to be at stake in the description of an act as virtuous or not, regardless of the agent's self-understanding. If a drone operator may become superb without ever conceiving of her work as honorable, or even being able to recognize her work in that light, might this not be a sign that our own ascription of virtue to the act is in some sense wishful and extrinsic to it, um, i.e. that, you know, that uh, we're somehow involved in what's pejoratively known as ethics washing or a sort of self-congratulatory but empty gesture. Um, and yeah, I guess the question is about different possible descriptions, you know, descriptions in name only, as it were, and what it would mean to have a compelling and true description of what's going on. Um, I mean, we call them drone operators, after all, rather than drone heroes. Is there not something 
distinct about our awesome capacity to kill from a distance that not only reduces the agent's capacity for courage, but in some sense bereaves the act of uh, ethical relevance altogether. Um, and I think in this connection, I, yeah, I, I sort of pause at the thought that um, we should not think of warriors as de-skilled, but as um, I think you said, uh, differently skilled. Uh, this sounds a little bit like a suspicious euphemism to me. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, just to reiterate the question, it may be that modern warfare requires certain technical skills such as would be expected of a computer programmer, well, why should we concede that these skills are specifically martial ones and patterns of excellence that are intrinsic to human flourishing at that, rather than simply conceding that most exercises of remote belligerence are no longer occasions to exercise the martial virtues at all. Uh, so it may be that we don't just need new words to talk about the way we wage war now, but, uh, but that we need to abandon the sense that these new words refer to their older versions. Um, I mean, yeah, I could say more about, I, I was very interested in your examples of courage and self-restraint. Um, um, I think, well, just to maybe abbreviate what I want to say, um, in, in most classical descriptions of courage, uh, staking one's life is constitutive, right? It is not um, uh, something that might or may or might not happen to attend on the act. And while you were, while you were speaking, I was, I was thinking about, I mean, you said that it, we might uh, regard it as a matter of happenstance, whether the drone operator is directly in jeopardy or not. And, you know, I was thinking of the difference between, uh, let's say, firing a rifle in battle versus firing a rifle within the context of competing in a biathlon versus firing a digital rifle within a video game. That would seem to be, you know, if we just focus on the skill, it is arguably the same skill, but the context completely transforms what I would say is the, the meaning of what is relevant to the action in terms of its virtue or lack of. Um, um, I think, yeah, and you actually picked, um, you, you anticipated one objection that I had on this line by saying that uh, the, that autonomous weapon systems cannot intend anything. I mean, in your paper, you said that um, we might expect them to act imprudently, but I'd have said that's they're neither prudent nor imprudent. I mean, any more than I would say that you know the the radio sings beautifully, or my you know Roomba vacuum cleaner exhibits the virtue of tidiness. Um, but I think you anticipated that, and uh, and so too the I liked what your student said about. Um, charitable self-restraint, because it seems to me that what, whatever is meant by closeness and whatever is meant by meeting and whatever is meant by seeing can't be treated as simply fixed across these different cases where uh, the encounters happen mediated by technology or not. So um, I think, uh, yeah, maybe the most general version of this first cluster is to worry that in, in, in using the language of virtue ethics, we may perhaps have relapsed into the problems with other systems of morality that made virtue ethics seem desirable in the first place. That is that we're treating the virtues as independent, ahistorical and acontextual givens that are supposed to be applicable at all times and places. So what would allow us to express with confidence that our ethical language must be applicable to these new contexts and what's at stake in getting it right? Um, uh, I'm going on for too long, so let me just briefly say what the second and third kind of group of thoughts I had was. Um, I, um, I it, both in uh, Paul Charest's descriptions of what uh, autonomous weapon systems cannot do vis-a-vis -vis their human counterparts and what their human counterparts are better at, um, I worry that sometimes it, it sounds like uh, we're judging the difference in fairly measurable, concrete, uh, you know, quantifiable ways, right? And um, that is, if we say that uh, computers fall short of general intelligence or um, that they lack common sense or that their action is not proportionate, um, my question is, what do we mean about the difference between 
you know, the, the human version of, of those things and the computer version such that um, what I'm interested in is making a contrast such that we're talking about something that could not be even in principle asymptotically approached by a better and better um, AI version. Uh, so, you know, cause I think it's important to say, um, uh, yeah, how we can articulate a difference in kind, not just in degree between human agency and its autonomous counterparts. So that even in cases where it looks like the AI is beating human beings at a specific task, let's say identifying non-combatants, we could still have some kind of justification for why uh, the AI is not involved or should not be involved in making ethical discriminations. Um, and I think, yeah, this is maybe a side issue, but I, I worry that once we accept this view in which there is a loop and human beings intervene mm -hmm. at a certain point, We've, uh, we've kind of conceded that, um, you know, there may come a point when, uh, you know, human beings don't need to intervene at all. So maybe we should be looking at the loop as such rather than the one place where we intervene. And maybe just to rush through this uh, third point, um, I have a question about blurred lines, which came up several times in your discussion with Sparrow. I mean, I think it's a common place to observe that contemporary, especially, uh, uh, you know, asymmetric warfare uh, blurs all of these categories that had not, that were not blurred in, let's say, Napoleonic warfare, right? Um, uh, and I think, I think that your rejoinders to the charge that we can no longer make these distinctions are reasonable and, uh, and, and maybe even true, but I guess I find this tug of war between, you know, the person who says the lines are blurred and then the response, no, we can still make these distinctions that we've made all along a bit unsatisfying um, because I'm not sure what it would mean to really vindicate either position. And so I, I wonder if um, that, you know, we could say um, what, is there some criterion that we could articulate by which, you know, we could specify this, this new way in which, let's say, war is happening, remote killing is happening, is actually not just a new version of, uh, you know, the combatant non-combatant distinction or the frontline non-frontline distinction, but something different in kind, I, uh, or or is no such criterion possible? I mean, maybe we just have to go on a case by case basis. But I I, I would like to have some kind of principle for resolving. Uh, disputes that take this form. And I wonder if you could say something more about that, but um, this has been too much. And uh, I don't know if you want to say anything, but we, we can also just open it up to the Q and A. Um, so we, we've got, I think we've got about uh, 50, uh, 30 minutes. So, uh, so if we're gonna have Q and A, let me briefly respond. And first of all, uh, I'm sorry, we're not in the physical space together because we could sit down and have a long conversation about this. Um, uh, so I, I could understand better your concerns and um, it would be a fun conversation. So let, let's do that sometime. Um, okay, first of all, yes, I mean, the, you expressed skepticism about really whether we should be, whether I should assume that uh, talking about virtue in relationship to the use of these weapons is relevant or appropriate and the, the phrase ethics washing as if it's, it's somehow it's a kind of it provides a kind of veneer of moral respectability for something that's nothing of the sort um that that, that that may not capture all your concerns but that's what i perceive yes. as some of them um yeah so so first of all the, 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 the desirability of applying um, of continuing to require the use of these like other weapons um, uh, uh, to be virtuous is of course because we, we want those operating them to be the kind of people who are capable of using them wisely and charitably and mercifully and with restraint 
in circumstances where they're not going to have time to think. <laughs> so we want them to be so trained they do it automatically because that kind of people they are. And I think we all just, you know, uh, um, um, you're not going to disagree with me that if such weapons are to be used, it's better to have them used wisely, et cetera, than not. Um, so there's that. Um, now the question is, you know, it's, it, it's one thing for people like you and I to sit here and idealize about how these things might be used virtuously, but that might, might have nothing to do whatsoever, really, with what goes on on the military ground. And um, it, you know, it's clear from, it seems clear, if Western media are to be believed that the use of weapons, not entirely dissimilar to these by Russia in Ukraine right now is not much conditioned by concerns about virtue. So for sure that, that um, um, in some cases, um, some circumstances talking about the virtuous use of these things is, is rather um, academic. But um, uh, my knowledge of um, Western militaries, British and American, suggests that there is more of a concern, um, if not entirely generated internally, then certainly generated by um, the press and by um, um, external bodies who are watching how our militaries behave. There's more of a concern uh, that um, um, military behavior should be virtuous and, and, and when things go badly wrong as they sometimes have done and they hit the press, military institutions are embarrassed and rightly so. Um, and, and it's good that they're embarrassed here. It's a shame they're not quite so embarrassed in Russia. Um, so that's my initial response to that set of concerns. Um, now, yes, um, da -da -da. Well, there's a difference in kind between human agency and artificial intelligence. Yes, I mean, I want, I, I rather think there is. I mean, people like like Ar Ar Arkin um, don't think so, apparently. Um, but um, judging by what I've read, um, lots of people who know more about these things than I do um, doubt that weapons are capable of practical wisdom. And in particular, within that of, of the act of discerning and discerning the intent of other people. Now, I, I haven't sat down to analyze uh, quite what, what is it about practical wisdom or the discernment of intent? Um, what is it ab about those operations that humans can do that non-humans Probably couldn't. I don't know is the answer, uh, but I'm I'm perfectly open to the idea that no, the, uh, that 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 um, there's some there is a difference in kind at a at certain points between human agency and artificial agency, um, and it seems to lie somewhere in there. At least that's that's what what other people think that that fully autonomous weapons simply can't do. And then final uh, point about blurred lines. Um, Yes, again, uh, do we have in uh, autonomous, fully autonomous weapons, do we have something different in kind or just a new version of, or, or yeah, a new version of something more familiar? Um, well, I, I think if, if fully autonomous weapons, yeah, we've never had uh, fully autonomous weapons before. Um, and they, it, it, they do throw up novel problems, particularly uh, about the allocation of responsibility. We never had that before. But I still think that, that, that the old, as it were, criteria can be developed to make sense of them. And I've, I've tried to begin to make sense of them in this paper. Um, I mean, the, the blurred lines that I didn't care about much uh, were, were uh, between um, when, when Sparrow was worrying about um, the, the lines between civilians and, and military being being blurred. Um, uh, my response was, well, not all military have to exercise the same virtues, so w why is that a problem? Uh, but to go back to to your initial point about um, yeah, the application of 
virtues to, to military operations. It seems to me that, that uh, totally with regard to courage, um, uh, until warfare becomes entirely a matter about using uh, autonomous or, or fully autonomous weapons, uh, um, we're, we're going to need boots on the ground, uh, probably always going to need boots on the ground, and, and boots on the ground are going to need to have physical courage. Uh, so, so some parts of the military will need to do, will need to develop the traditional military virtues, and there's, you know it doesn't doesn't take take much to explain why um, 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 uh, why com why combatants in the field throughout history have needed to to acquire certain uh, qualities of character to be able to do what they do effectively. I'll stop there, leaving about six minutes for. Q and I think. Oh, terrific. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so far, we have one question in the Q&A by uh, Chris Coonan, uh, who says, couldn't the computationally powerful ways that AI-powered automation systems frame problems and develop solutions lead to an over-reliance on AI decision-making tools that over time would result in the moral de-skilling, especially a practical wisdom that Valor talks about? Deference, not mere mediation to the decision-making function of AI, seems to take the if all you have a ham if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail problem to a level beyond the traditional issues associated with automation bias. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good question. I think that's probably right. I mean, um, but this has to do really with um, military culture, I think. At at the top, um, my USAF um, friend who read this paper made the point that um, um, it, 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 it's when, yes, I mean, I mean uh, um, overconfidence in the, in the use of weapons is not something that you will find at a tactical operational level where, where people, perhaps for reasons of career, are quite cautious in using lethal weapons. Uh, but but when when overconfidence seeps into doctrine and then seeps into inst to, to, to instructions, it then begins to infect the the whole institution. Uh, so I think um, that, that does a yes. I mean, one sees it. One often sees it. Not not I, I've seen it not just in the military context. Uh, the assumption that somehow technology will will um, provide the answer, and um, a tendency to oversell technology, and to downplay the risks. Um, I think that that's a strong tendency in our culture. Um, and I've read about um, a tendency to, to defer to technology. Uh, so that's all there, uh, but it, it, these are cultural features. Um, to what extent they can be combated? Um, I mean, in principle, they could be. And um, uh, if those at the top of military institutions were persuaded of the dangers of this complacency about technology, uh, then the, there are ways of an for an institution to make people uh, throughout the institution be alert to the dangers. Uh, whether that will happen or not, we don't. I, I mean, it's a matter of practice, not principle. Um, here's another question from the Q&A. Um, why do we not, uh, by anonymous attendee, uh, so uh, why do we not talk about AI used to come to peaceful proposed solutions, looking for patterns to negotiate that do not escalate into destruction? Okay. Um, okay, uh, <laughs> good question. Uh, um, the, the 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 Pacific uses of AI, the uses of AI in um, um, promoting peaceful means of conflict resolution should surely be a topic. Um, I, I have no clue how that would work. I, I have no idea what the Pacific uses of AI would be, but if there are some, we certainly should talk about them. I agree, and uh, as a Christian, one should probably talk about them first and last. Um, uh, that wasn't my brief, as my second response. <laughs> um, but yes, no, that, uh, you're absolutely right. That, that needs to be a topic. Uh, but well, but uh, so somewhere, somewhere, I guess someone needs to persuade me, first of all, that there is a, a use for AI in, 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 in 
di- diplomacy. Well, and yeah, I think you might easily say that it's, it's a principle of just war, that it be for the sake of peace, right? That is, um, sure. uh, that is the end. But um, I think- but I, I, just, I just can't, uh, at the moment, I can't imagine how AI could be useful at all. Is there, can you think of any ways? Um, no, I, I mean, I was just thinking in the context of um, waging war with minimal civilian casualties, oh, and, yeah, yeah. you know, something like that. But um, uh, yeah, well, I, that's, I think... yeah, in, term, term, in terms of well, I mean, AI, AI uh, certainly can can insofar as it allows the drone pilot more more, as it were, um, uh, uh, insofar as it frees the drone pilot from. Uh, the emotions of fear and anger and resentment uh, to, to deliberate more carefully about whether to fire this weapon and to assess the risks of civilian damage. In a sense, um, AI aids restraint in war, uh, but that's not, uh, in a sense, I mean, that, that, that's, that's how Christian love gets applied to war. Um, um, but there is also the, the issue of, of um, um, and I suppose insofar as restraint in war makes a just peace more possible in the way that unrestrained war doesn't, that serves peace. But I, I thought you I thought the questioner was, was asking more about forget war, let's talk about let, let's talk about Pacific means of resolving conflict. But I, I, I just can't my imagination doesn't doesn't stretch that far. But it, if there are ways in which I, AI could be used, then we should discuss that. Um, I think we're at time, but um, thank you so much again, Professor Bigger and let us <laughs> remotely clap, and uh, uh, we're very grateful for your time. No, I've enjoyed it. It's, it's been a very useful discussion, and uh, I wish I could uh, take part more fully in the conference. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor Bigger, and thank you so much, uh, and John, for your, your wonderful remarks.